Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 19. And in this segment, we're going to talk about stationary fronts and occluded fronts. So we're just going to include both of those in the same segment. So let's go ahead and start off by talking about stationary fronts. So again, the symbology behind this, usually to represent a stationary front, you have alternating uh, red or alternating warm front and cold front symbols. So it typically goes uh, warm, uh, warm front, cold front, warm front, cold front, or even vice versa. And uh, again, for the upper air portion, where you have a you have a, the open symbols versus the surface portion, where you typically have the closed symbols. So the semicircles and the triangles are closed if you're looking at a surface front, and then for an upper air front, these symbols are kept open; they're not filled. Uh, stationary fronts can be kind of interesting um, for a couple reasons. One of which is a stationary front. Remember the definition of front where we defined as being having a relatively strong thermal gradient. Stationary fronts typically have relatively weak thermal gradients, even in comparison to a warm front, uh, especially during the summer. If you get a nice stationary front in the summer, you probably won't notice very much change in temperature as you go across the stationary front. And uh, that's what kind of makes the, that's what kind of makes the definition of a front so fuzzy and ill-defined. We can't really, there's really no uniform definition for a front. And it's, primarily for this reason. It's just, you can have a thermal gradient, yes, but is it really a significant enough thermal gradient to be classified as a front? And that's just the question that after uh, almost a century of meteorology, we still can't answer. So uh, I don't know if it's going to be answered anytime soon. But another characteristic about stationary fronts is you typically have a relatively weak wind pattern. So with warm fronts and cold fronts, you can have really strong winds near the vicinity of a warm front and even a cold front. By stationary front, you can have maybe at most five knot winds, if that. Uh, sometimes the winds are just perfectly still right, at the, right in the vicinity of a stationary front. And that's typically how you'll identify a stationary front is the winds near the, the front tend to be relatively weak. You can have really, you also have, tend to have relatively weak uh, winds near a warm front, but a stationary front, they are especially weak. And of course it's called a stationary front because the front's not moving uh, or not moving really to speak of. It might be moving slightly, but it's not really moving fast enough to be called, say, a cold front or a warm front. And because stationary fronts are not moving, these are often associated with flooding events. Uh, if you think about how you've got this frontal boundary that might be triggering a bunch of showers and thunderstorms, and if that boundary is not moving, then you're just going to be triggering showers and thunderstorms all in the same location, and all those showers and thunderstorms are potentially going to be tracking over the same area. But you can also get flash flooding events from a cold front or a warm front if those fronts are moving slow enough. But a stationary front is very frequently a heavy rain producer because the front's not moving at all, and that gives you a much more conducive environment for, say, a flash flooding event of some kind. Although stationary fronts are also can also play an important role in certain types of severe weather events, especially a derecho event in the summer. A lot of times the stationary front is the focus on where the derecho's winds are most intense. But uh, we'll talk more about this in greater detail once we get into the severe weather unit. But something to keep in mind, stationary fronts can be important for certain types of severe weather events. Uh, even to some extent, tornado outbreaks, stationary fronts can play a role in those. But usually, uh, if you're going to have a severe weather event with a stationary front, it is going to be a derecho event, which is going to be a, a straight line wind event, but mostly. But again, we'll talk more about this when we get into the severe weather unit. And the other front that I was going to cover during the course of this segment is the idea of an occluded front. So again, I remember back to the previous lecture where we talked about the anatomy of a cyclone. As the colder air overtakes the warmer air, you get what's called an occluded front. And that symbol is represented as a purple line with, again, alternating series of triangles and semicircles. And again, for an upper air occluded front, or for any front at all, the symbols are left open. They're not filled versus the surface front. They are still filled. So again, just any upper air front, you'll have symbols that are not filled. And for any surface front, you'll have symbols that are filled. And again, occluded fronts usually occur when a cold front overtakes a warm front, but uh, you can also technically have an occluded front in, say, a Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone, where if you happen to get the warm front overtaking the cold front, that can also give you what's referred to as an occluded front. Although I believe the term for that is more of a secluded front, SE instead of OC at the beginning. Uh, in fact, that warm air intrusion in the center of the cyclone is often referred to as a warm air seclusion, if I remember that correctly. But uh, as far as the general properties go, if one air mass overtaking the other, they're both pretty much the same. Another interesting thing about occluded fronts is the vertical structure. These can be very, very, uh, they can vary quite a lot. And 
this again, this kind of goes back to what we talked about in cold fronts. You can have really shallow cold fronts. You can have really deep cold fronts. You can have really weak cold fronts. Cold fronts come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So when that cold front overtakes the warm front, and it also makes sense that occluded fronts can also come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but even more so because um, you might also have different characteristics in the warm front. You're combining the two. You're getting a lot of different possible combinations for the vertical structure. And this will be something that you talk about in greater detail in your senior year, where you'll get, I believe it's in the mesoscale meteorology class, where you'll talk more about the vertical structure of some of these fronts. And that will also include the vertical structure of occluded fronts, which again could be uh, come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. And occluded fronts are also where you tend to get a lot of widespread shower and thunderstorm activity. Usually it's primarily showers, just regular rain. Uh, it tends to be very gradual. It doesn't tend to be especially heavy. Of course, there are exceptions to that, as there are with pretty much anything in the atmosphere. But you can also get thunderstorms, again, if the conditions are loft, or if the ambient conditions are favorable for thunderstorms. You can also get a lot of thunderstorm activity around these occluded fronts. But usually, on any given occluded front on any given day, it's usually just a large mass of showers and maybe a few embedded thunderstorms. But that's going to do it on this segment for uh, uh, for stationary and occluded fronts. And in the next segment, we're going to talk a little bit about identifying fronts on a weather map. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.